Um, and then kind of drill down to the actual research that was done, actually involving help. And, uh, and part of that uh, research involved the expansion of the, the development of human, the human mind and consciousness from very, very, very current research in neuroscience. And, um, and some of that actually was done here. Uh, and then in terms of the publications, it's actually leading to a book which will be ready by I think around January or in the you know, winter or spring of 2020. Uh, I'm the chief editor. Uh, it, I think Dr. Chan and Jeffrey is contributing. I have eminent people involved in this project. And the title of this book is Advancing Innovation um, for International Graduate Education with Sustainable Outcomes. So now, for us, sustainability is not just about green and the ecosystems, but also relationships, culture, and human development. Uh, a lot of my talk, again, I'm trying to ground this to find traction, if you will, uh, in terms of the actual publications which I've had in the last 10 years or more. And that looks at the development of human potential and a very radical shift in the teaching learning paradigm. Since I've been teaching only in graduate school, it's kind of limited to the graduate school environment. Uh, nonetheless, it is also being used in uh, elementary schools in the United States, uh, secondary schools, and so on. And so I shall give you examples of how an, a technique of transcendental meditation, in this case, or TM, uh, as was brought by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and as being promoted around the world. In fact, we have a school in, in Kedah, uh, a Chinese school, which has taken this up uh, from, from the local TM movement. And they're doing so well. And these are kids who have come from marginalized families, a lot of dysfunctional families. They're doing so well. Uh, I'm thinking, and I haven't really got down to it, in approaching uh, Mitra, uh, which is the Indian agency for I think under the Prime Minister's office, right? Uh, we did present to a Professor Ra Rajendra, I think you know him, yeah. last year, but I was in the US, my colleagues presented to him and he was impressed and they wanted a proposal. My niece, I don't know if you know her, her name is uh, Subi. And she's Datin Subi, she's married to Dato Sundar Subramaniam, who's the son of, you know, my brother-in-law, right? Dato S. Subramaniam, who's uh, having minimal consciousness right now because of an ailment. So nonetheless, I've been more or less in charge, but I've been so busy with my own graduate school stuff here. I've been publishing and I teach about two courses a semester, right? And um, so this book is a fruition of my time at HELP and the time in the US with the University of Maharishi's University, uh, plus my experience in global consulting firms. And to cut to the chase, let me start as they always do with storytelling, an anecdote. Um, when I was, after my PhD, I was recruited by te technology consulting firms. My PhD was in learning sciences and I went through three departments on a fellowship at the University of Iowa. Uh, prior to that, I did an MBA in Maharishi's University on a scholarship. And prior to that, I did a bachelor's and master's degree. The bachelor's degree was in psychology, um, accredited by the British Psychological Society, and a master's degree in media and technology. Uh, at the University of Leicester, and I went off to America. And after my MBA, I felt I could find a, a kind of magnetism amongst my business colleagues, which I didn't find in the PhD classes in psychology, even though we're interested in people. So anyway, I did get a, a scholarship and a fellowship, and through the psychology department at the University of Iowa, which is ranked in the top 25% in the US, uh, and then the business school, and then the Psychological and Quantitative Foundations at the Lindquist Center, uh, the School of Education, and they funded me for my research. And uh, they are famous for testing. You know, Psych and Quantitative in Lindquist Center, they have a gifted education center, which is world famous. Uh, and they have, uh, they put out the ACT, all the college testing. So my research in my PhD was in schemas, how to unpack schemas, mental structures, uh, and it was difficult to simulate in a laboratory because schemas, social schemas have a real world kind of contamination. But nonetheless, I was able to simulate the evolution of a schema. And what it was 
discovered was there is not a monotonic performance function. The more familiar you are with a subject or content, familiarity and, and exposure leads to greater performance. That's not true. There's an up and down kind of wave-like function. It's a quadratic function or a polynomial function. So then also, I was, as I said earlier, I was recruited by consulting firms. One is now rebranded as Accenture and then SAP, a German firm. And they take a lot of smart people. The first thing that I noticed was when I was recruited by Accenture, the, an American partner told me to hide my PhD. <laughs> this is interesting. We don't want people to know that you have a PhD. So, I mean, I understand where they're coming from. They, they're not arrogant, but they a little bit disillusioned with education. Uh, and he says, you know, and over the years when I was in consulting, I, I meet CEOs and they always tell me this lament, I don't want graduates who can understand articles, uh, comprehend articles. I want people who can synthesize, can evaluate, can adapt best practices, make the leap of faith, make decisions with Im imperfect data. Now, to be honest, they are right. You know, so the way we are approaching education is actually very much oriented towards this misfit, this disconnect. It's not about how intelligent you are or how much you know that's irrelevant. It's how you use information, how you apply. Right now, in environments like Malaysia, China, India, Southeast Asia, ASEAN, they are going through rapid transformation, right? And it's almost like you don't have time to think or reflect. We have been a trading nation. Malaysia is one of the top 20 trading nations, as you know. Um, so the, the, the kind of ethos, if you will, is about uh, packaging, branding, uh, co-opting with partnerships, even in education, right? So we are not familiar with the process or the inputs. We are familiar with, we are brand savvy. You know, we're not a knowledge society, right? To be a knowledge society, you must have a respect and a stature towards knowledge and teaching and education. We have gone from exporting commodities, uh, palm oil, rubber, tin, and manufacturing now is a major part of the economy, but it's also still commodities, semiconductors. So we're stuck in the middle income trap, as you know. But we are very brand savvy. You switch on the radio, you watch television, Everybody is very cool in their pronouncements, in their language. BFM is so cool. 98% in their own admission is American content. But everybody is shouting Malaysia. But then if you go around Malaysia, you find that this, you know, Malaysia is not Bangsa. Malaysia is not BFM. There's a 70% rural uh, kind of a, uh, psychology, which is quite different. And it kind of creeps into the education and policy and so on. Uh, and so we are actually, this is nothing wrong, it's just that many, like many Asian countries, except that Malaysia is more complicated because it's multicultural. We are compressing our industrialization. What it took Western Europe 300 years, we're trying to do it in 40, 50 years. Japan did it in 50, 60 years. Now, as you know, the Industrial Revolution is passé. Great Britain was the first country in and the first country out. It's a hollowed out economy. And as you know, America is also in the post-industrial stage. We talk about fourth IR. I shall come to that later. Uh, but it's the knowledge economy, which this turn of phrase came around the turn of the century. Peter Drucker came up with the idea of knowledge workers and the late Peter Drucker. And in the knowledge economy, it's not about commodities anymore, even though oil is very powerful as a weapon. They want to weaponize it. And rubber and tin served as well. Oil pump serves as well. But it's about how you, just like raw material, you process, you extract the ore, you process the ore, right? You take a rubber, natural rubber, you process it into latex. It involves processing. Now, in the knowledge economy, you process data. Data is processed into information, and information is processed into knowledge and ultimately wisdom, right? And the knowledge economy assets or perceptual assets are essentially psychological. An example is brands. Brands are perceptual assets. We have brand equity. And so at the turn of the century, this concept of the knowledge economy came. 
and then we had the dot-com rise and crash. But nonetheless, it has not just survived, it has actually flourished. Uh, much of our work has migrated into the knowledge economy space. Even education, we're using handheld devices, smartphones, and so on. So I wrote a paper on the knowledge economy around 2003, 2004. I was a professor at the International Business School at UTM, uh, in the MBA, Strategic Management. We were partnering with Cranfield, and we had a visit from a delegation from Finland. They liked what I said, and they invited me to, to Tampere to give the keynote address with Nokia. So the paper got published, and then I was invited to Geneva, the Global ICT Summit. And so I have a model which I kind of gleaned in my consulting experience in tech firms, finding why some people can quickly connect the dots, synthesize with imperfect information. Some cannot, they are fragmented. If I take them out of their functional roles and put them in a new domain, they cannot thrive. But there are some who can, right? And so I realized there's a different kind of mechanism involved in the brain, right? A lot of our skill sets today uh, in education are meant to be wide and deep, which is what education should be. And what you go and do at work and you go, to, you go for further learning and training is good, it's vocational. But education should not try to be vocational. Education is holistic, deeper and wider. The word educre, right, comes from the Latin. Means to rear, to bring out. It's not about shoving information into you. But let's be honest, our education system is shoving, cramming. Students are actually being uh, regimented to find out what's coming out for exams. Right? And even though the government says we must go to higher order thinking and I publish in higher order thinking, uh, the reality is the, the whole system is oriented towards exams, papers. So in the consulting environment, I found that nobody does brainstorming on their own. People work in teams. You have to work in groups. You are in groups where people may hate each other, but they have to deliver. But nonetheless, there is learning. We learn how to be to unify diversity, we learn how to harness the diversity in viewpoints, and they do very well, right? Those who are stuck in a particular concept, theory, or model cannot unfreeze from it, and they don't advance. They cannot problem solve. And those who are in a functional department, right, uh, they may have 10, 15 years in oil and gas or banking, and that may intimidate, let's say, a fresh MBA or a master's degree holder you know, they will say, who are you? I've been in this line for 15 years. You have an MBA, so what? And to some extent, it's true. But the moment I take that oil and gas veteran out of context and put them, let's say, in financial services, they'd be lost. But as I take the MBA after six months or a year and put them in financial services, they will learn also. They have to learn, but they will adapt faster. So I realize there's two different kinds of knowledge systems. One is a functional type, domain dependent, Right? People, organizations are organized into departments and units. And another one is basically the ability to synthesize, to problem solve. Now, there is already this sense of this dichotomy uh, in the uh, vernacular. So people say functional skills, technical skills, and soft skills. You've heard of that, right? I don't like that kind of a distinction because when you say soft skills, people think it's not very powerful. It's actually the opposite. Problem solving, leading, communication, being creative, thinking out of the box, managing diversity may be soft, but they are very powerful. In fact, Google did a piece of research in the last three years. Uh, Google is, as you know, headed by Sundar Pichai, and the vice president of people analytics is uh, Prasad Shetty. He's from India. And he said that uh, even with creeping AI, and you know, with big data, Google was the one who created this, this, this notion of big data around 2007, they, they consolidated everything. And they found that while they were very successful in promoting their tech people, the promotion did not come from technical skills. It came from the so-called soft skills. Now, I teach selection and placement, and I teach talent management. And so, they are right. And so, while the AI and big data is there, to facilitate decision-making, 
uh, in terms of human capital, it is they found out from the engineers that they don't want machines to make decisions about people. They want people to make decisions about people, in this case, promotion. We can use the data, but in the end, we have to resort to our wisdom. And this is Google. Google is not a philosophical NGO. Uh, they are in a very ruthless industry. Now, there are many other industries. One is Infosys, which has gone through a, quite a long saga of succession planning, an Indian company, you've heard of it. But before Alibaba, it was the most successful IPO in the NASDAQ. Yeah, Narayan Murthy. And uh, they, they went from 250 US dollars to 29 billion US dollars. Most Malaysians have not heard of this company. They're a knowledge company. They have taken on my old firm, Accenture. When I was in Accenture KL, my, my boss was later the Asia, Asia, from country manager, he was in charge of Asia. He laughed at what's going on in India, but in India, they don't have the infrastructure. They were looking at Talian in Northeast China. Uh, it's not infrastructure like roads and buildings, but it's what's between your ears. And today Accenture has its largest talent pool doing the heavy lifting in southern India. And they are very diverse. They are one of the top preferred employers around the world, along with Google. And, and they have a CEO who is a lawyer, a woman. And diversity and inclusion is very, very much a, mandate, a mandated policy in human capital. And why diversity? It doesn't mean it doesn't, it's not about ethnicity or culture alone. It's also your discipline, what you studied as an undergraduate. And yes, you work for a tech firm, but we find there's value that you bring. Now again, it harks back to my two systems view. One is a functional domain and one is a non-functional. Uh, people loosely say it's out of the box, but no, it's a different mechanism. I shall come to that soon. Now I'm going to zoom out, if you will, and look at what I call change drivers. Now if you're taking notes, you want to bear in mind, there's a, there's a difference between a trend and a driver. I'm going to sit down for a while. Uh, a fad, let's start with a fad. A fad is shorter cycle. Okay? It's fashion. Can you leverage a fad? Can you make money from a fad? Yes, you can. A lot of the millennials, they will follow fashions. Some are hipsters will say, no, I make my own fashion. But from songs, from popular culture, ringtones, you can download. But a fad is short cycle. It comes and goes quickly. Next is a trend. A trend lasts longer. Halal, halal Chinese food was a trend when I was growing up in Malaysia, but now it's a driver, right? A trend lasts longer than a fad, and suddenly you can leverage it. In fact, to find a non-halal Chinese restaurant in the Klang Valley is harder, isn't it? Right? So then, next is basically what I always refer to as a driver, change driver. Now, a driver, unlike a trend or a fad, a driver is in your face. That means you have to respond. You either don't, if you don't respond, you ignore at your peril. If you respond, you can leverage it as an opportunity or minimize it as a threat. Now, I'm going to just shift gears a little and mention this name, which usually puts off academics. Uh, this is, thank you, Edmund. This is uh, Thomas Friedman. Now, I don't have anything against this guy. Actually, I like him, right? He wrote the book, uh, the world is flat, which caused a sensation. That was like 15 or 18 years, 16 years ago. And people all say, oh, this is, he's just a journalist, he's superficial, da da da. But to be fair, he raised something which was not known. The outsourcing industry in India was completely missed by academics. Now, we all know of China roaring ahead. And even in the 90s, we knew by straight line extrapolation, the Chinese economy will grow under Deng Xiaoping's reforms. But nobody expected this tech phenomenon in India, which came after Y2K. And Infosys was already designing the uh, fuselages for the Boeing Dreamliner. This is not call center work. They were designing the navigation systems. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, Wipro's TCS won the Ferrari engine design contract in 2004 and became Ferrari's chief innovation partner to keep Ferrari in the F1 grid. And not many people know this. So now I'm scratching my head and people are wondering, wait a minute, what ever happened to functional skills, uh, domain skills? How can people who are in tech, who code, go in, zoom into one context and then go to another context? 
you know, I thought you need to have years and years in manufacturing, whether it's in electronics or in automotive design, and now you're looking at aviation. There must be some layer of knowledge here which transcends the functional context. It seems to be a pyramid. The ability to code is key. Now, everybody says, when I was in tech, oh, coding is a commodity. Now, that is completely false. Yes, people can learn how to code, but to code well, is not, that's not a commodity. Some people can get it in 10 minutes, some people will take 10 days. It's an aptitude, what I call fluid intelligence, which I shall come to, right? So when you are able to identify, to isolate, identify, going in this sequence, isolate, identify, um, combine, simulate, and then synthesize models, starting with the isolation of data, right? And then identifying the variables, then combining them, then simulating them with models. Actually speaking, you can go into any industry. Take manufacturing. Is assembly critical? Right? But can robotics do that? Yes. Now we have software-based manufacturing. Code is embedded in the manufacturing. Right? China wants to get out of this factory model. And they already, it's, a, it's been a service sector economy for over 10 years already. Most people don't know that. India wants to get into manufacturing because even though it's low level, it's jobs for the masses, right? You live hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But forget about the developmental trust of migrating from agriculture to, you know, to industrialization in the old paradigm in terms of factories and development of infrastructure and land and now going into the so-called knowledge-based society. Um, and just look at the knowledge-based society, even though the term is about 20 years old. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you have manufacturing or not, to be honest. If you have a critical mass of people who can do what I just said, they can be wherever they are. We can connect with them. So for example, they can deliver MRI analysis from Chennai to Rochester in New York overnight. While the Americans are sleeping, these Indians are working in Chennai, right? Because of connectivity. The knowledge economy collapses time and space. It's not a Newtonian phenomenon. It's quantum mechanical. It collapses. It doesn't completely collapse. There is some time, but you know, geography is history, as they say. It doesn't matter where you are. If you have the skill sets, I will find you. I will contract work to you. Of course, you need to have a reasonably good infrastructure. I'm not saying it's completely independent of infrastructure. So these are the drivers. A driver is something that forces you to change. You cannot ignore it. Another example of this, is what I was talking about is a technology driver. In education, we have a technology driver, right? The way we learn, right? Now, in culture, we also have a, a cultural driver. We have a whole millennial generation. Uh, and you know the memes about millennials, you know, they are like this, they are whimsical, they cannot commit. If you look at the literature, there's very little research on millennials, which are formal. There's some in marketing, and a lot of it is basically authors and social media who are making this me millennial meme very provocative, and to be honest, some of it is true. And so I supervised a gal, and she's at Taylor's now, and she did a study on Malaysian work values, but she found it kind of matches what uh, the memes are, though very little research, formal research. And so this cultural shift in terms of millen the millennial driver is that where I live in the US, many do not like automobiles <laughs> and they come from the cities. They want a different lifestyle, sustainability. They say cars kill people, they don't like the oil industry. And if you give them electric cars, no, too expensive. Why? I want a different kind of model of ownership. I don't want to tie myself to a loan. And housing, housing should be for everyone. We can own, but I don't trust the banks. Now, of course, you may say that's just a minority in the US. But remember, if the driver is accelerating, coming back to Tom Friedman, his second book, Acceleration, have you, I haven't read it, but it's, it's all over the internet. He gave a recent talk in London, I think uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he's right. Um, the drivers are not actually unfolding in a sequence as when I was growing up in Malaysia. We had five-year, you know, remember you had five-year plans, Malaysia five-year plans and all that, right? I don't know whether you're old enough to remember, 
right? And uh, then something comes along and whacks you and derails you. Oh, let's do this, let's do that. That kind of algorithmic thinking doesn't cut it anymore. And secondly, because of these interconnected drivers, everything is in your face almost all at once. So what may seem like a minority in the US in a particular community may not have to take a very long time to take the opposite example, China, to find, let's say, people wanting vegan food. They don't want, they don't want meat because meat causes all this global damage or whatever, environmental damage. Oh, China is not ready for this. Be very careful. You find pockets of change in China, as I am finding. And remember, China is also an ancient culture, along with India. And uh, they, while they may seem aspirational on the surface, they're opening up, they want to consume this and consume that, and everybody's, wow, wow, look at this, right? At some point, they can get quite literally sick of this. This is, this is not what we want. There's something more to life than this. It'll hark back to their traditional philosophies. And they have, you know, holistic medicine and so on. Uh, so now, this is where I think the, the frames we've been using in, uh, in the 20th century, because we were so American dominated, and America was going through a steady state evolution after the Second World War. Uh, we had industrial organization psychology. I was telling a colleague yesterday in a meeting, it's old. I even tell my colleagues in Subang, this is old, forget it. The Americans are trying to get out of it. And then they, we're looking at sociologists who are more open to being inductive, right? Observing on the ground and then building the model. Is that right, Edmund? Yeah. For psychologists, oh, no, 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 that's not science. You must have a priori hypothesis. And you must do literature. And I think hey, the literature doesn't have the outsourcing industry in India. They completely missed it, except for Wharton School in the University of Pennsylvania. They then set up uh, a school to study outsourcing at Wharton. Wharton is famous, right? And this is huge. About over $100 billion and jobs were going. And you know, high-end white-collar jobs, this is not manufacturing, high-end white-collar jobs, R&D jobs are going to India. And you know, so this has become a political thing. And it's not about left versus right. That's an old label. You can't stop this. Trump cannot bring the jobs back, neither could Obama. You've got to face facts. This is not Democrats or Republicans or, or conservatives or labor. And it's, not, it's, it's a cheap shot to, to, to criticize CEOs this is, we are in a global economy, and right now it seems like there's a slight regression to identity politics, you know, the rise of the strong man, you know, it's Trump and Xi and Modi. This is temporary, I believe. It's just my opinion. The genie is out of the bottle. We are in a, glo in a globalization, full throttle mode. We can't go back. I can't take 1.4 billion Chinese back <laughs> through the door that came out. 120 million Chinese leave China every year and go back. And we're not noticing these shifts. These are drivers. They're not just tourists. They are being exposed. They are learning. They're comparing prices. They have expectations. Yes, Facebook and, uh, and Google and YouTube may be banned in China, but how long can you do this? You can't. This is the thing about the knowledge economy. It's fluid. It's, it's kind of cognate with my notion of fluid intelligence. You cannot dam it up physically. It'll find a crack and creep. It kind of transcends the physics of Newton. Action and reaction being local, it requires land, terrestrial infrastructure. Yes, we still live in that kind of Newtonian world, but knowledge seems to float a bit higher than that. And I can connect people mentally around the world with the new technology. So technology, cultural shifts, millennial expectations are different. Uh, the notions of steady state sequential unfoldment as we go from one era of economic development to another, it's probably not so straightforward. I'm saying, I'm putting this very conservatively. Uh, we are in a mode of acceleration, as Thomas Friedman says, apart from you know, terrorism and so on. But notice that we are also experiencing paradigm clashes. Religion and politics, you know, my God is better than yours, my religion is better than yours, uh, my political system, you know, it's Western democracy is better than yours. And then, you know, the people still engage because of trade. And there's also people-to-people -people interaction. Now, these drivers are accelerating, right? So, I mean, this, in terms of change management, which what, what I teach, I find the curriculum is old. It's based on American psychobabble and doesn't understand the Asian context. And I don't think we can so quickly, easily dismiss, uh, you know, the American context, because a lot of their articles are written by Asians as well. 
Because the reason I say we can't so quickly dismiss is because we are not providing an alternative narrative. You know, it's very easy to criticize, oh, this is Western, this is hegemonic ideology, da, da, da. Okay, now what is your alternative? Do you have empirical research and a philosophy of science, right? It's not just Western, it's, it's, it's a methodology. Right? I agree that science does not equal method. Science is bigger than method. But provide me with me an alternative. And that is not forthcoming. So we use the Western method. And I will remove the label Western. You know, I would say this is a method of scientific validation. It so happened that it was developed in the West, but we use it, it gives us a lot of things. It may not be uh, adequate at times, yes, but I, what is the alternative? I don't find a ready alternative. But there are alternatives, but it's not yet in the mainstream, whether it's from India or China and so on. So I'm gonna use this. Uh, nonetheless, remember that we are in parallel processing mode. So if you look at this, one bright spark when they saw this, these are changed drivers. He said, these look like sperm attacking an egg. Now that is not, literally not an off the wall analogy. Uh, because the drivers are, you know, basically, it's too small for you so far away. Technology, regulation, deregulation, you know, WTO, China came in and everybody, you know, the ele elephant in the room or the dragon in the sky. Uh, India is the elephant in the room. Uh, Malaysia, we've had all these things like which are government-led, top-down. The MSC, which is the MDEC, top-down. Uh, Proton is also government-driven, top-down. Um, the deregulation of the uh, telecommunications market is government-led. Financial services, you know, rationalizing the number of banks, government-led. So that seems to be the characteristic in East Asia. It's usually top-down which is not a bad thing. It's necessary in the stages of development. You need to have some control of industry. Uh, but interestingly enough, it does involve one precious resource called land. So that's why you have people like Renong and UEM and the government, they build the North-South Highway. And in my consulting years, we partnered a lot with these guys and they can really waltz you around <laughs> for the big, big infrastructure projects like KLA. Uh, I'm, I'm on video, so I won't say anything anymore. Um, you need to have those connections, and we don't have those connections, okay? So, uh, but at the same time, there is a legitimacy. This is my point, uh, because government will underwrite the risk. But in the knowledge economy, it's flipped. It's not top-down. In fact, some people would argue it's bottom-up. The very good example are the Indian IT companies. Zero connections with government. And from day one, they're doing world-class stuff. Let me give you an example of what this means. Have you heard of uh, CMM Level 5? CMM level five is Carnegie Mellon mat capability maturity model, CMM. It comes from Carnegie Mellon University. Now this is the accolade in the technology enabled services industry. It's not just about coding. Huh? It's about managing virtual teams, delivering to aggressive milestones, right? Uh, with deliverables. And this is, a, you know, one, over a trillion dollars, this industry is a roiling industry, ruthlessly competitive. Uh, capability maturity model. Just, you know, you Google CMM level 5. There are about 105 to 106 CMM level 5, the highest level. It's very hard to get. About 95% maturity. Matur maturity model. Maturity model. Yeah. But in relation to what? Technology enabled services. Oh, okay. Which means it's everything. <laughs> everything involves technology today, from education to banking to all the traditional industry domains. Remember I started out this morning saying functional, then there's something else that's floating, another layer of knowledge. Now this fellow comes along and says, yes, I'm this floating piece, but you need to have certification to be world-class. And if we are going into the outsourcing industry, you know, you could be bare feet in Chennai, walking on a pothole road with elephants and, and cows, I can't trust your competency, that kind of thing. Okay, but here's the thing. 95% of the CMM level fives, can you guess from where? India. India. Perfect score. Any help from government? Zero. They tried this in Malaysia very hard. Only one or two. Even then from an Indian company. China tries this. So people are now saying this is rubbish. No, I think it's sour grapes. It is very powerful. 
Level five leadership, team management, integration, you have to be very tightly knit. So I'm noticing now, hey, 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 what's going on here? We are bypassing something. We are leapfrogging. Okay, another driver, Golian, I think, in CAS. You heard of CAS, but I'm going to use acronyms because I need to paste this along. CAS is Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. You heard of them, right? Very prestigious. 2004, he did a study. Um, study of 12 inland, very, very innocuous sounding study. 12 inland cities in China for internet adoption. But the findings were phew, phenomenal. He found that the uh, uptake propensity, that means the adoption of innovations, uh, is immediate. There's no lag between availability and adoption. You know, the old marketing curve that they teach in business schools, like this, right? And then this is diffusion, right? And this is time, and this is percentage adoption or whatever. There's a lag. They're early adopters, sometimes it may intersect, you know, interact. But here it's collapsed into one. Now here's why, 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 why do I say that? The sexy coastal cities we all know, Shanghai and you know, Beijing, Italian, Hangzhou and all that, these are inland cities. And the adoption is not based on size of the city or the demographics of the individual level of education. So it's not the traditional developmental evolutionary pathway. It's leapfrogging. Do you understand what I'm saying? As soon as it's available, they take it. Now, how many of you teach students from China? Do you see how fast they, <laughs> they get it, right? And I'm looking at the Malaysians. I know, there's, there's a difference. Now, of course, you may say that they are just procedural thinking, da, da, da. But the hunger, you can't deny. And same with the Indian students. We are living in the 1960s, and some of my older generation, my fathers, some uncles, Sango Club is the Mecca. Very colonial. <laughs> and I really believe even amongst the younger people, they fantasize that the Brits will come back. <laughs> <laughs> I found a 25-year-old on, on oh, this is being recorded, I shouldn't say this. People think, you know, why a Japanese car like Lexus so much attention in Malaysia? And they're talking about Jaguar. Jaguar is, you know, a trollop. Uh, saved by Tata, you know, it, you know, and uh, they are having still problems, yeah, Jack, Land Rover, you know, and so we still have that mentality, and there's a reason why Malaysia is in a world of its own in some respects, you know. Um, but coming back to this, I think you get a sense of what's, where we're going. There's other drivers like... Um, I just will have two questions. G-I-T-I, what is that? Just in time. Just in time. It's manufacturing, now it's also in services. That means I need information, right? I am, let's say, a loan officer in a bank. I don't go to the office. How many of you have relatives working in a bank? You know, they, they, do they go to the office? Those who are going, you know, they have to get mortgages. That's, that's how they're measured, make loans. They are running around. So I can give them all what they need on this, even competitive intelligence. And this is not new, Jerry. This is uh, 20 years old. When I was in SAP, already we had this. It's just the, the people are not using it. I must see you in the office from 10 a.m. to 5. I don't care. You have the numbers. You deliver. You manage the process of the leads. I'm happy. Now, this is not just a Malaysian cultural artifact. To be fair, it's also a German thing. Let me give you an example. I used to work for SAP. I published a case which it has, you know, it has gone with somebody who was director of the World Economic Forum, uh, Frank Jürgen uh, Richter. He was director for East Asia. He liked my case and he put it in a book, Human Intelligence Deployment in, uh, uh, in, in Asia, Asian Business, the fifth generation project. It's the name of the book, right? Yeah, that's the book, Human, Intelli Human Intelligence Deployment. I think it's out of print. It's by Palgrave, London, uh, Macmillan. Now, it's just a chapter. Uh, and we were seeing firsthand a lot of, uh, you know, we can't frame things so easily anymore. Uh, for example, SAP is a German company, right? And um, the man who recruited me, and I was headhunted, created a role for me, and then, this is, is this being streamed, is it? Right. Uh, anyway, it's published already, and he was fired that day when I showed up for work. Now, they brought all the numbers in. Number one in ASEAN for revenues. Why, would they, why did they fire him? Because uh, he wasn't documenting. 
The Germans, that's very important. Culture clash. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And then I saw the change in culture. I, I was open season first. He, I can go into other people's accounts, but I don't take their commissions. We organize along verticals, you know, oil and gas, financial services, but I can go across. They will get the commissions, but I can open doors for them. And we can get, and, but they were all very frightened. Even though nothing is being challenged, they're still stuck in those silo mentalities. And then the most remarkable thing was how the culture shifted in their attitude towards the previous leader. They were now saying not nice things about him. Or he was like a dictator. Before that, he was fatherly. So we are a very high power distance culture still. You know, what is that, right? Hofstede is very hierarchical, very feudal, very paternal. And most people, you know, fall off the chair when they hear Hofstede saying Malaysia scores very high. No, 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 we are warm and friendly compared to Singapore. No, we are confounding two different dimensions. We can be warm and friendly, which ameliorates the hierarchy. We don't feel it. Boss is still boss. <laughs> Titles are still, you must have Tan Sri Dato, must call somebody doctor, that sort of thing, the rituals. You know, this is the first time in my interaction, I am in a room like this, otherwise it's me and then desk in front like that. You know, it's very hierarchical. So these things are getting in the way. Our frames for understanding development have been dominated by economics. And psychologists came along in the 20th century and to, to be fair, they gave us a lot of insights into uh, work psychology, but it was in a steady state environment of the US in 50 years, not much big shifts. At the turn of the century, we got whacked. Big shifts accelerating, change drivers. And the traditional I and O paradigm in psychology, I have to be sorry, I have to say so, doesn't cut it anymore. And we have to look to our sociology colleagues, our anthropologists, our ecologists to understand in an era where everybody's you know, in cheek and jowl with each other, uh, working, learning, mingling. And yet we have these ancient paradigms in the back, the probable nine tenths. We don't want to unpack those because, oh, it's too not convenient for me to get to know you really, or your culture, or your spiritual values, religion, as long as we can you know, interact superficially. But those things are not going to go away. They will manifest like a jack-in-the-box. And they will say now, how dare you assume these things? Uh, this is not my priority. That's your priority. Value systems clash. I've seen this firsthand. And I realize our graduate schools are not preparing us. And the irony is we are in the vortex of the sea changes in Malaysia, around the world in Malaysia. We have front row seats and we don't get it. Do you understand what I'm saying? We are at the crossroads. The Straits of Malacca is the busiest sea lane in the world. Among, one of the busiest, right? And we are a multicultural country. We have gone from agriculture to the knowledge economy in less than 100 years, 50, 60 years. You know, so we are leapfrogging as well. But at the same time, we're not an extreme culture. We can compromise, give and take, soft. Perhaps softer than uh, China and India. And maybe that's a good thing because it, you know, we, it, we can, it allows us to reflect. But I don't think we are really doing that, taking advantage of that. We are just rushing like consumers. Education is like uh, fast food, co-branding, right? Uh, you must have a foreign partner, Auss Aussie university or a British university, right? We're not looking at the inputs and the processing. We're looking at the packaging. We are brand savvy. So there are these disconnects, but nonetheless, it's still a comfortable pathway, if you will, for migration, while these drivers are accelerating. Now, um, fundamental to understanding and framing what is going on in the world, everyone says it's education. And then that, but that's not enough. As my colleagues tell me, CEOs tell me, Mohan, what is the use of an, an MBA? What is the, I mean, PhD is even worse. You don't even dare mention a PhD. I, I have so many MBAs, they can't perform. I hear this all the time. Now, of course, they are biased. They're smart people. Uh, but there is something to their complaint. You know, I don't want people who can understand text. 
I want, I, want, I want people who can brainstorm on their own to show their creativity and write papers. I want people to work together to come up with solutions. I want them to be able to fit a square peg in a round hole or vice versa, to adapt best practices, 60-70%, troubleshoot, imperfect data, make decisions. I want them to be educated. I want them to be capable of deep thinking, to synthesize critical thinking, to formulate policy, long-range impacts. That's why I want educated people. Advanced degrees better. But I'm not getting these people. So what happens to us? Do we drill down to becoming a vocational kind of a nature and education? I don't think so. I think we should stay true to the original roots of education, which is educate to rear, or what we say earlier, gurukal, knowledge and wisdom. You know, in China, it was basically uh, Lao Tzu, right? That kind of philosophy, which is the basis of Confucianism, right? In India, it is a gurukal. And also, it's not just an Asian thing. It's also found in, in the Western cultures, right? It's wisdom. It's holistic. It's deep. And it's long. And it is domain-free. It's the ability to transcend, if you will, the content and be able to come up with decisions which have long-range impacts to think widely and deeply. Except that we have to do it very quickly uh, today because of these accelerating drivers. Um, so then this firm, these firms, the one that I mentioned first, they invested about half a billion dollars partnering with Institute of Learning Sciences at Northwestern. In some respects, they were arrogant. They started knowledge management before um, the internet came. They had their own knowledge exchange running on Lotus Domino. And then the internet came and made it even easier. And to give an example of what Peter Drucker said, now he coined the phrase, the knowledge worker, Peter Drucker. He passed away in 2004, I believe. And in the last interview with Fortune, he predicted some of the things that were happening. Some things he got wrong, but some things he got right. He said, India will be a knowledge center. And sure enough, McKinsey started its first knowledge center in the world following Accenture in India. They have the brains. Now, they don't have the scale of China, nonetheless. By that time, they exceeded. Now, China has got more graduates than anyone else in the world. And this is where Drucker was wrong. He said China does not have, but China has moved. It's, you know, they have, you know, it has outpaced everybody else. But they started the knowledge management. It's not just managing knowledge as a database, but coming up with the insights, higher, higher, higher order thinking. Insights means something deeper, not obvious. And that's how the, the trend morphed into a driver. And so many of them are quietly, very surreptitiously, um, it's going on in India. Now, I talked to many, sorry, uh, Arjun, right? Yeah. Uh, many of my, many of the locals don't know this, you know. I, did it surprise you? Even though we're three hours from Chennai, and everybody flies to India quite often. They watch Tamil movies. They had absolutely no idea about what's going on. Even Indians from India. The Chinese, they'll know everything. Because the Chinese government you know, makes a vision of what they want, and everybody gets the vision, and they will drive. India is you know, what you call a functional or dysfunctional democracy. So the private sector has to, to do things on its own. And some people have even gone as far as to take credit. As I said, this is a bottom-up process, not top-down. Unlike manufacturing, it's bought, it does not involve land so much. Some people have gone as far as to say the, the success of these Indian tech companies is because the government didn't interfere. I think that's wrong. You cannot give credit to an agency for not doing anything. There's no null hypothesis there. I mean, you, I mean what if I did or don't do, I cannot test that model. You understand? So that's a kind of excuse, I think. If the government helped them, I think they'll be even better, like the Chinese government is doing. You know, they have a vision for AI and everything. So now, but the point is, it is true, though. Nonetheless, it is a bottom-up. I'm just saying, well, it doesn't have to be so excruciatingly bottom-up. We can provide support at the early stages of development. And in that respect, Malaysia was right. Why we fell into this trap of the uh, Parwaja? I've been to Parwaja eight times. Parwaja is a steel company, <laughs> right? in Gurun, in Kedah, and, uh, and in it's, Kamaman, it's a very sad story. These guys are red-eyed, they're working so hard, and they're going to be laid off. You ask them clues about strategy, blind as bats. Ask them about everything else in the balance scorecard, about uh, 
latest best practices, uh, inventory management, process rich. They get all the ISO accolades, HRD accolades, but blind in strategy, no direction. Why? Top down. They supply steel to Petronas. Some years ago, Dr. Go and I went into another company, a shipping company, where the, their customer was Petronas. So they are in safe harbor, literally. So there's no need to think of direction. When China wakes up, I want steel. These guys are not ready, Prabhaja. You see what I'm saying? And then even China has excess capacity now because, uh, or rather, they have overstimulated the economy. That's why the part, that's one of the major reasons of the slowdown because too much commodities. Too top down also is not good. Um, so now, the top down approach seems to characterize the earlier stages of development, just like parents, you know, when you bring up children. I want to control the amount of information you, I don't want you to be confused and overwhelmed, you know, like William James said, you know, it's an overwhelming barrage, right? So we will structure the environment, also the information, what you're exposed to. But at a certain point, you must let go. And it turns out, in my own research, and what my colleagues, they, it seems to be a cognitive paradigm as well. The two different systems. I'm not talking about left brain and right brain here. In fact, there's no such thing as left brain and right brain. The specialization, I'm talking about two different systems. Remember again, this theme will be repeated. It seems to map against our approach to education in industry and the post-industrial age. Functional and what I would call domain-free. It does, a lot of the organization of our resources in society reflects this. You understand? And my point is, uh, I think it is uh, archaic. We need to be more fluid. The examples of fluidity are found in fluid intelligence, which can operationalize, and there are ways to measure it. Also in the knowledge economy. You see, it's a different paradigm. Don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing manufacturing. I'm not criticizing commodities. They served us well, right? But now the labels, the frames don't fit, right? And we have now another major driver, which is so-called emerging or surging markets. Now everybody says, well, excuse me, Asia has slowed down. You know, look, the hot money is back in the US. This is a temporary aberration. China may have slowed down, but an economy growing at 6%, if you believe the figures, it's a $13 trillion economy. 6% is huge. You understand? The US is about 23, India is between 2 and 3, right? Uh, Malaysia is almost a trillion. We had 4.5. Still growing. I would say, therefore, it's dynamic. But remember, drivers in parallel, a lot of unpacking. Let me ask you a simple question, maybe I'll take a short break. Um, let me give you a, a, a stimulus, if you will. We were in technology, and we thought, oh, it rolled out this innovation in banks merging in Boston. Business process re-engineering, best practice. Bring it to Malaysia. Is it just unpacking a box <laughs> and apply the best practice? And we have smart people, people with MBAs and even PhDs who came up with this. Excuse me, it's not working. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> Then what, number one, number one criticism always comes out, our culture. Oh, hey, wait a minute, culture? You mean there's a, this is, I thought this is culture free. This is about procedures. This is not about, you know, what is your favorite actor? Or, you know, what religion are you? This is about following a methodology. It's because you have to change the attitudes to work, uh, to share knowledge, what to disclose, what not to disclose. It's cultural. These are the norms. But oftentimes, it is also used as an excuse. What I just said was legitimate, but sometimes it's not true. It's an excuse to mask other things. Could be just inertia, self-serving inertia. Let me give you another provocation. When it comes to consumption, is there a problem with culture? To go and drink in Starbucks or wear fashion, whether it's China or India or Malaysia? You don't think so? So why, why this uh, strange... Uh, Disconnect. One is work, one is hedonism, right? Consuming. Work, nobody likes to work so much. And now I'm going to make it complicated in your life. 
I'm going to say, I'm going to redesign your organization, no more departments. I'm going to promote people who have less functional skills, less experience, but they can fast track in talent management, resentment. I've been an engineer in logistics for 10 years, and you're promoting this guy after two years. What's more, he's young. I have a completely different view of how this organization should go. I don't want to standardize jobs anymore. I undertake talent management. I will design jobs for certain people to add value and measure them. I will empower, but I also hold them accountable. Right? And because this person can thrive in different functional spaces, they can even go beyond the industry because I want to partner with other industries. You see now how I am challenging the status quo. But this kind of leadership is necessary. That's why the old paradigm is now in collision, right? But the immediate response is to bring back, out of a conservative response, strongman tactics. It's not a coincidence, I believe, we have strongmen back in power because of being overwhelmed. Do you understand? We feel more secure. We feel, you know, it's, we're insecure. We want somebody who's done it before. But in many respects, I look at where we are today in this country. It's like a replay of the 90s. Do you understand? It's just the currency and the accusations and the scandals and the same guys on top. It's just that. It's just like buying time. It's all we're doing. We are afraid to go further. We're stuck in this middle income trap. And the organizations, everything I'm saying, Jayadi, whether it's business process re-engineering, the merging of banks, uh, HR is passe, uh, HR can be outsourced or automated. It's human capital. It's not new. It's over 20 years old. I'm not saying anything new. Let me say that again. I'm not saying anything new. It's 20 years old. It's just that it's taking us so long to accept this. But here's the thing. This is not going to wait for us anymore to play catch up. It's just inertia which is actually holding up the process. Now, so the question I had for you before the break was culture. Culture is a laggard. But it seems to be a laggard when it comes to adoption of best practices. It's not a laggard when it's consuming. You know, I want to get the latest iPhone or the Huawei or anything like that. But when it comes to me learning a new method or an application which is going to change the way we work, I want to see who else is doing it first. It involves more effort. But at the same time, it's just like, you know, what we're trying to roll out here, right, with analytics. You know, it's top down. Dr. Chan says, do this, do that, do that, do that. And even I'll have my own little you know, grumbling and quirks and all that. You understand? But I cannot uh, ignore this. If I want to stay here. Right? So now, extrapolate that on a larger scale. It's the same. But being uh, an educational institution, um, we need to be more than cognizant of these aspects. Uh, and so education should be what it's supposed to be, which is classic, deeper, wider in thinking, right? It shouldn't be just downgraded to vocational training. As, as much as the industry complains, your graduates don't fulfill our needs. Uh, that, means we're, that means, you know, we have not even fulfilled our classic vision and mission in terms of deeper and wider thinking, right? And then the confusion of these drivers, adding another layer of complication is that I want people to be skilled at analytics and big data, da, 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 right? They may lose out on the classic. So I need us at least to understand where we are and where we are going, where we are coming from. And that means basically drilling down to the level of the teaching learning process and evaluation. Now we have, again, a classic top-down paradigm here. The new education minister has got all these visionary views, but it seems to take time to translate to action at the lower levels. At the same time, if you look at Perwaja, as I mentioned earlier, and Proton, all top down. And you can't blame Dr. M, the other guy, not me, because he was advised by McKinsey to do this. It was Kenichi Omai, a Japanese consultant at McKinsey, who told him, you know, you are now big enough to have your own car and then to have your own steel. But again, top down. Mahindra and Mahindra is not connected to the government in India. Mahindra and Mahindra 
they acquired Sanyong. Have you heard of Sanyong, Korean company? It was bankrupt. They turned it around successfully. Did you know that? They design and outsource manufacturing. Because manufacturing, you don't, even robotics can do it. But to design, the design competency is about what I told you, the sequence of coding. Identify, isolating, identifying the variables and simulating the models. So I can go into automotive engine design to design the die. I can go into aeronautics. I can go into designing handhelds. That's where the premium value addition is. And I have critical skill sets around the world. They have a huge number in India. Most people don't know. Blockchain and so on. All right, so now where these are not creeping anymore. These are in your face, these drivers. So Thomas Friedman, as much as academics don't like him, I must say he's right. Uh, if you do literature reviews, you won't find these things. Just like you won't find the so-called millennial shifts in literature reviews. And these things are going faster and faster and faster. And we cannot ignore this because we are at center stage. Malaysia is right, a multicultural country. The Straits of Malacca is the busiest sea lane. We have moved rapidly. We are geographically in the middle as well. We're also stuck in the middle income trap. But not many know this. Huh? Let me just ask you. Do you know what the per capita GDP of Malaysia is? Nominal? 11,000 USD. If it PPP, what is it? Do you know? You'll be surprised. It's about 30,000. It's very high. Very high. It's already a developed country. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, that's the Gini coefficient. Thank you, Edmund. That, no, the Gini co I mean, I'm not an economist. Are you an economist? The Gini coefficient shows our wealth gap is very wide. Yeah. Now, this guy from the UN came recently and made things worse, yeah. saying all those things. But actually, it's not so bad either. You know, but it's not that great either. And we are stuck in this middle trap. Uh, so, but the point is... Yeah. Yeah. I have the privilege to mix it down. You know? Then you realize the real yeah. Quite, uh, everything looks very good, you know. Like when I went to Penang, you know, I was from Penang, you know. So I thought Penang is Penang, you know. Then I was attached to the welfare department for, for about a month, for the, for my second year. Then because of the welfare department, I went down to the grassroots level, and I find in the prosperity you're talking about Penang, eh, a lot of hidden poverty, hidden... You mean that's, that, that's not captured, is it? Not captured. But only, you know, you only realize that when you go down with Yeah, I mean, so, okay, then we have also ethnic policy. So that kind of adds another layer of confusion. But isn't, it's not that fantastic as we think. You know, if you hang in Bangsa, listen to BFM, oh, we are so sophisticated. We are living a better life than Americans, <laughs> right? We are so cool. But this is the thing. Yeah. We, we, I don't see that side. We are living in a bubble. But here's the thing. My friends will say, Mohan, you can talk all you want, but bubble is reality for me. And this bubble is very comfortable, and we are thriving, and we are making money. Now, it's true also, yeah. because you know, a small micro, this small minority here, which is having it so good, is also generating a lot of wealth for others, isn't it? Right? You know, so I don't always want to fall victim to the idea that I must average out everything to get a true picture, like per capita GDP. Oh, the lowest common denominator kind of mentality. You know, I, want, I know a Congress in India. Everybody must be equally poor. <laughs> this thing is being recorded. Uh, you know, I mean, look, I think if those people are achieving what they are achieving and they are, have this disdain for, for what is this um, social development, which means more taxes and, more from, and then you have to help and uplift. And I don't want to get into this left-right kind of thing in politics. Uh, I don't want to interfere with that because they are risk takers, they are entrepreneurs, they are generating wealth and they can live their cosmopolitan life. Yes, I have poor people, marginalized and so on. I must find a solution. I don't want to drag these elites down to make everybody equally, you know, I'm not left or right, but I'll be, in America they'll say I'm left, in Europe, in England I was accused of being right. I forget it, I don't care about these labels, you know. I was in the University of England where they are so left when in America, it's just the opposite. And then, it's, you know, then I realize this is really got nothing to do with me. Because we are developing so fast, we are bigger than these labels. Do you understand? Unfortunately, these labels have come here as well. 
And the Americans have learned the European labels now with Trump. They are looking at... When I was in America, nobody knew what working class meant. It was blue collar. Now it's in their vocabulary. They learned this from the Brits. Oh, I'm just working class and so on. Meanwhile, the millennials don't care about these labels. They are you know, trying to forge some kind of destiny of their own and saying this is all old stuff. You know, the Democrats left and the Republicans right. And to a large extent, they're right. Similarly, even though we are older here, right, it doesn't really apply to us. We can be traditionally Asian, you know, whether Chinese or whatever, proud of our cultural integrity and want to maintain that, the mother tongue and so on, but we can be futuristic in our thinking. Do you understand? Being, being open to entrepreneurship, technology, being bold, not clinging to, oh, the, you know, the, you know, what happened in the 30s and 40s and 50s in the UK or in Europe. That is not relevant to us. There is no trauma over the great humiliation in China. There is no hatred of the so-called genocide from the Mughals in India. There is no hatred of the, the British rule. They get along well. There's warm, in fact, they're very warm and friendly to the Brits. They don't say, oh, you did this to me, you did this to me, like in other parts of the world. Same here. There's no kind of resentment against the, the Brits. And I don't hear the Chinese complaining about the opium war or, 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 or the great humiliation. The message I'm hearing and I'm sensing is, hey, respect me. Treat me as an equal partner. Mind, mind your own business. Let me do what I want to do. Let me conceive my, let me fulfill my values and let the trajectory of our development continue. Don't judge us. This is what I'm sensing. You understand? But unfortunately, the frames we are using come from that part of the world. And again, I'm saying, I'm not against that. It's just that we have not provided an alternative. Maybe it'll take some time. So now, I'm going to take a break, if you don't mind, and you can ask me questions just to... Then I will finish the session with showing you the, 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 the model that I have, uh, and then I shall go into briefly into consciousness-based education. Dr. Chan was interested, but I never got around to... I think, to be honest, I was afraid. <laughs> he wanted me to do this here, and I was afraid because I don't know what people would think of me, right? So I left it, put it on the closet, yeah, and I go back and hide. Any comments, any questions? When you turn the knowledge company, it's just like a, like a metaphor for the world. Mm, yeah. even, even cement manufacturing, the old classic brick and mortar is a knowledge company. Have you heard of CMAX in Mexico? They're a knowledge company, even though they, they manufacture cement. Now, Lafarge in Malaysia is uh, owned by YTL. They're into all these knowledge aspects, into uh, knowledge management. I've supervised so many projects in knowledge management. You know, the so-called Chinamen companies, Petronas in Tanaga, all the GLCs, they invest millions because they're GLCs. They will invest in knowledge management. They get BCG, McKinsey, and all this. But look at the actual you know, um, uh, application. It's not there because it's a cultural thing. I, and I guess my students are working and they come and I supervise projects. So I, I supervise one Chinese company called Autopack, right, in Malaysia. SME and the MD wanted knowledge management. And we, and we, we conceived it. And the guy who was charged with rolling it out was my student in MBA. And it worked so well. Why? It's top down, just like the GLC, uh, but it's smaller. And the CEO was driving it every step of the way. He wasn't just giving speeches and walking away. He wanted to you know, drill it down, rolling up his sleeves. So I mean, this is where I say culture, as they say, it's, it's just masks a lot of things. I don't like that label. I need to unpack that. So there, are, there is variation. There are Malaysian companies who are world class. You've not heard of them. And there, are Malaysian, there is Malaysian talent, which is world class. If I take some of my friends and colleagues here and often look at the success of the ethnic Indians in the US, they're phenomenal. But I, look, I take these same people I know here, I put them there, they'll be phenomenal. So then I need to unpack this. Is it the country? No. It has other factors. Motivation, inspiration, structure of the organization. Sometimes it's just information, something very simple. These people don't even have that information. They don't know. But I find that as an excuse because you must be in active denial. If I have the internet, I travel so much, 
I can give you, give you a study tour, fly business class here, see this, see this, there, and you don't see, that means you are in active denial. You come back to your comfort zone in this country. You understand? Now, we have, we're a country which consumes, we are saturated with concepts. Every weekend, there's some seminar going on somewhere. There's some training offered somewhere. I mean, you drive on Jalan uh, Samantan, you see the, all these billboards. Every expert in the world has come here. HRDF is there to pick up the tab, right? Uh, we have, you know, lots of degrees, but it's saturated. Are we applying it? No. See, one of the things I was told when I was told to hide my PhD was, if you can apply, if you have 10% of what you know, it's fine. Keep the 90%, you may need it later for the deeper things. We don't try to show how much we know. This culture is very pragmatic. It's an East Asian culture. The people who are leaders in this country, uh, they, want, they don't want concepts. You know, I learned this from a guy called Katek from India. We were working, he was in Leo Burnett. We were doing a branding project. Our client, my client got pulled up by World Economic Forum, by the same guy I wrote the book with, right? Uh, it's, I'll tell you the name, it's uh, uh, Scully, right? Uh, and they were a small incubator in, in UPM. You know, UPM has, in those days had an incubator, right? And uh, we came up with a brand essence, which they liked. And then the WEF noticed it at Davos, and he, they, they got this guy who was the CEO up. The Global Leaders of Future platform, they have this platform, the, the WEF. And what we found is, and Katik was right, he said, Mohan, in, in Malaysia, he's from India, he says India is different from Malaysia and east of Malaysia. East Asia starts from Malaysia. There is Malaysia, Singapore, China. We don't try to impress people with how much we know. I, it took me some time to process that. Uh, he's talking about the higher levels, leadership. We, we only reveal a few things. Now, India is different. They will take something which is black and white, and he says they will turn it into something grey. Here, they want something grey to be turned into something black and white. Do you understand? The tolerance for ambiguity is less. Now, he's right. Now, so while we think we are educated, oh, you know, we are educated, right? And then we go and mingle with the ministers or even the, the brash CEOs of the corporate world, right? It's almost like at some point they don't respect you. They think you're just a nerd. That's why we never try to... The word intellectual is a bad word <laughs> in East Asia. It's almost like saying you are irrelevant. Do you understand? Very polite way. Now, the irony is we are in an intellectual industry. And then there's pressure now for us to connect to the needs, the urgency that these drivers are throwing up against us to apply, right? And my response is we don't downgrade what we do to something vocational. We stay, in fact, we need to go back to the roots and re-examine how we are developing knowledge and delivering it while being cognizant of these things. We don't respond with a knee jerk and downgrade. That means more skills, more skills, more skills. No, it's not about skills. It's something deeper. At the same time, pragmatism is a reality here. They're not interested in concepts. I learned this in Accenture when they partnered, even in America. Katek tells me in India and America is different. They can be more intellectual. You can have debates, even with CEOs. But even I don't agree with them completely because I remember my partners telling me in this firm that they learned from a psychologist called Daryl Connor, managing speed at the change of light. He says, paradoxically, you slow down, but you never tell CEOs concepts. They don't like concepts. Now, what do we do? We educate people with concepts. When we come up with a plan to change the culture of our business process reengineering, it's a conceptual architecture. The first reaction is, how do I do this in my organization? It's going to take five years. I've got to change the nature of jobs. There's going to be a resistance. First response is, don't call us, we'll call you. How much is this going to cost? Five billion US dollars. And you see results at five, forget it. If you put a room full of CEOs in this classroom, I can talk to them about change management, latest hot buttons. I ask questions, they'll all put their hands up, they'll all give me the right answers. I'll ask them, do you want to do it? They'll politely walk out. 
So that means people understand the concepts. It's not about how intelligent we are. It's the motivation to apply is not there. It's not, that means the will, the willingness is not there. See, again, this is another factor that seems to be coming up. We have the knowledge, but we don't have the will. And these things are accelerating, okay? I'm going to stop there. I want to hear your thoughts, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, thank you very much. You know, I enjoyed your your presentation very much because it talks about a different level of. I've only used one slide so far, right? Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. Talk about looking at uh, changes from a different perspective. Uh, while I was listening to you, uh, many things crossed my mind. Uh, number one, the philosophical background of these early civilizations. Uh, I had this uh, privilege of teaching Chinese philosophy, basically three thinkers is Confucius, Lao Tzu, and uh, Buddha. And uh, I was very excited with Lao Tzu, because Lao Tzu don't give you an answer. Yeah, it's the but, pathless path. Yeah, Lao Tzu are pathless path, you know? It's a transcendental. So, yeah. I, I admire Lao Tzu because he throws challenges. He leads you to find the answer. And I think that leads you to creativity, many kind of things. They don't look at the way they see one percept those kind of things. Okay. Now, equally enough, Rob, when I look at Indian philosophy, I also feel something like that. See, from the early period, there, there is, you can see the the contradiction between uh, Brahmanism and then Jainism and Buddhism, you know? It's called Dharmic, Dharmic, uh, Dharma. They challenge the ideas, you know, challenge the they ideas. They are not different. They are Dharmic. Yeah. It's the same as uh, Taoism. Yeah. It's, one is basically foundational and what you interpret and turn into uh, a way of life, it's yeah. on the surface. That's yeah. Buddhism, Jainism. Yeah. The way Hinduism is also wrong. It's Dharmic. It's, it's an Eastern so label. Yeah. Yeah. What I find uh, we have this heritage of to differ and to look at things differently. Yeah, it's well. subjective. Yeah, very subjective. It's our mind. Uh, our yeah. mind. Yeah. If we appreciate the heritage, yeah. I also got quite a good knowledge of Tamil philosophy. Mm. You know, so you look at things uh, from a different perspective. Yeah. You know, okay. But Perfect. This is, problem, uh, this is the place I'm very serious. You know, I'm very worried about future Malaysia. <laughs> So what I find this compartmentalization mm. into Muslim and non-Muslim. You have to ask Edmund here. He's, he's a sociologist here. Yeah. Yeah. And then also into mm -hmm. what I feel that like it deprived of people from looking at more important things in their life. Are we educating our people to face the challenges of tomorrow? Are we using our knowledge and creativity to eradicate the challenges, poverty, and other things that our people are facing in this world? So what I find this compartmentalization, this dogmatism, right? It come and prevent us from thinking along the line they propose. This okay. Time. So what's your response, Prof? Huh, based on our current political education system in Malaysia, and also the political development, they emphasize so much on the pros, religion, and racism. You know, that deprive us huh, from breaking this and plunging into a different world. Okay, I'm I'm going to take a, a sh give you a short answer. Yeah. I'm positive. Uh, you want me to unpack that? Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> Edward, anything to say? Chime in. Um, I think managing diversity is what is an yeah. issue here. Yeah. Always slows you down. But when you integrate diversity, you are more robust. Managing homogeneity may give you an edge because you can execute faster. I give an analogy like a speedboat. You had full throttle going at 60 miles an hour, which is 100, and 100, 100 kilometers an hour. You assume the environment around the speedboat and the canal or the stream that you are racing in is going to be the same. No disturbance, no change. So you can go full throttle. But the moment you hit a rock, you crash. That's the advantage and disadvantage of homogeneous environments. In diversity, you are like a raft. You go slowly. You feel every inch or centimeter, since we have a metric over here, right, uh, of the way. But you cannot sink the raft. But it gets where it's supposed to go. It meanders. Now, uni unity for me in Vedic philosophy, as you, as you raise, it's called Sanatana Dharma. Vasudeva Kutumbakam in Sanskrit means the world is my family. You break it down, what it means is everything is as near to me as the, my most intimate self. I see myself in all beings, whether it's a cat 
or my enemy, and I see them in me. It's Brahman, Brahman. Absolute. Yeah, absolute. It's consciousness. Yeah. I am just an expression of the wholeness, and we are all of that same reality. But we are different also. So that means I embrace diversity, and I unify. Unity is not uniformity. Any religion or political system that wants to unify by making everybody the same will fail. Because there are individual differences. And let the individual dis differences go to the extreme. Right? So integration that is born of diversity is going to be robust. You understand? It can withstand shocks, these drivers. Others cannot. It will slow you down, of course, but it makes you strong. Right? So yeah, that's why I'm positive about Malaysia. Uh, you know, we all complain because we know it can do better. It's 30 million people, for God's sakes. But look where we are. We are at center stage. We don't get it. This is, you know, we've got the best seats in the house between the east and west. And if you want to research, this is the place, the gold mine. You're sitting on a volcano, right? You know? But the motivation is not here amongst my colleagues. The easiest response is, I want to get out. You know, why bother? I mean, uh, come on, I go through this every day. I can't change the system. But I don't mind living here because it's comfortable, it's cool, I can hang in Bangsa. But more on this, Malaysia is not Bangsa. Malaysia has got all this, like you are saying. But I don't need to know that. My friends are making money. They're traveling here and there. I want to be like them. This is the kind of elite Malaysian thinking. And we're still living that. But even with all these challenges, as you raise, uh, Arjun, it's still got a future. It slows us down, but it'll be a robust society. Even now, with all these things we hear in the media, right? Oh, it's going to lead to segregation. Uh, and we're on a slippery slope because these guys are saying this. But I don't see violence. Do you see violence? I don't see that kind of, uh, you know, even Thailand, which is the darling for Westerners. Oh, Thailand is better than Malaysia. You know, you're from Malaysia. Yeah, but you know, I would say Malaysia is more stable than Thailand. Is it true? It is. It's true. We don't have coups. Now, we are moderate. We have high power distance, but it's warm and friendly. It's a culture of compromise. So I'm positive. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But this has been my experience. It's slower. But remember, we're also diverse, right? 30 million people is not a very big population, you know. Of course, by that same token, we should have advanced more. But instead, we have gone slow. We're stuck in this middle income trap because we want to bring everybody along. The argument is, you know, it's not everybody, it's only for this group, all right? And so there has to be some kind of a, you know, some negotiation. But some saying, no, it's never going to happen, this group is we're going to lead to segregation. I don't think so. The genie is out of the bottle. People realize the, the value of giving and taking from the diversity. They don't want to retreat into their own caves. Do you understand? Okay, now I want to finish up this. I want to go into the research itself the publications, and then some of the things we talked about, if you don't mind. Now, I won't be offended if you have to leave, okay? Uh, but if you want to continue, we can continue, yeah. I give you, so far, what I've just given you is the background, right? So we all know this. Uh, the future of jobs, right? We've, heard, we've seen this many times. Uh, it's on the World Economic Forum. Right? Um, it's a simplification. And I think uh, Geoffrey is working on this as we speak. And I've got this book that's coming out. Uh, and so this is this, now 2020 is next year. It's less than a year away. I'm sure you've all seen this, right? Uh, the top jet, 2020 versus 2015. Let me just read this out. Uh, you know, complex problem solving. Oops, I lost my signal. Uh, in 2015, this is about five years ago. Uh, everything is more or less the same if you notice, right? So there's not much difference from in five years, right? Sorry? How is it different? I mean, creativity is from 10 to 3. All right. Mm. But they are in the top 10, yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's my point. Uh, so now, point is, do you see anything functional there? Anything functional? That means you know fun 
functional skill knowledge. Let's say engineering, logistics, insurance. All very consciousness-based. Yeah, this is again transcend. This is the floating layer, yeah. right? Can see, Prof, here, these all are core and fundamental for for a good society for 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 to handle things. You know, when I look at all the titles, the ten skills. But it's not functional. We are not functional. Mm. You know, it's not like engineering, mechanical engineering, oh, yeah. electronics, or IT, yeah. or medicine, yeah. or accounting. Thinking, who did the job? Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, let me ask you another problem. Who would be best to, to diffuse this, to develop this as a profession? Okay, let's forget about the exact uh, labels. Is this education? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Train, I don't like training because training is very narrow. Even though, but you can train people for these things. I know where you're coming from. Trainers will say we can train you this. But you should get all this in education. Without downgrading to training or being vocational. That's my point. Okay? So we're now going into fluid intelligence. Right? And then going into some of my research. Now, I'm going to skip these slides because uh, I want to paste this along. Are you familiar with this approach? No. Double loop learning? A lot of the learning we have in, in problem solving and consulting is single loop. That means we don't unpack, critically examine the context. I'm an example of Parwaja, Proton, McKinsey, Kenichi Omaito, Dr. M, do this, do that. And after 20 years, 30 years with Proton, we found that they've got all the accolades, just like Parawaja, in terms of training and development, human resource development, the skills, ISO and everything. But the number one glaring skill set they don't have is the design competency for designing drive trains, which means the engine and the transmission. They partnered with Lotus. Early days was Mitsubishi. I had people who, I had a Japanese student working with all three, right? And he tells me now he runs a logistics company in, in Bangkok. He did his thesis on Proton going to China and he was offered a job on the spot by Mitsubishi. And he saw the dynamic between Mitsubishi and Proton and how uh, Lotus came in. And you know, it's very clear that they don't have, and they, they were, a lot of money was spent to develop the, the design competency. It was never, never, never achieved. And now the industry itself has gone to a, a different EV. Yeah, e EV vehicles, hybrids. It's a hundred year old paradigm, internal combustion engines. Hundred years old. Top down, a lot of money spent on single loop learning. That means I just send them for training, uh, they improve efficiency. Now, something you might want to write down, which I'm not put in this uh, bunch of slides is, we are in an era of discontinuous change. Discontinuous change means like this. With the drivers, right? Your delta is different, right? Continuous change is like this. We are not this, we are like this over time. And this is not going to let up. Since the year 2000, the next 20 years will be like this. Our TQM, balance scorecard, our continuous Kaizen manufacturing is continuous change, steady state. There's also a misunderstanding of a transformation leadership. Uh, transformation leadership suits continuous change. That means you and I have time to clarify our values, get to know, handhold, we can plan, we can have all this, you know, ac the communication skills, bring the inside aspects out because we have the luxury of time. When we have disruption, discontinuous change, it's urgency. You understand? Right? So the, the, the kind of meme involving continuous change is misunderstood. When I say transformation, my students usually think it's here. Because they have this kind of a Superman image. <laughs> Superman comes to a situation where the drivers are whacking you. There's urgency, oh, Superman is here. So transformation is for urgency in 
disruption, discontinuous change? No. When you are in this state of change, discontinuity, uh, it has to be directive. And relationships are transactional. This is the irony. Because I, you know, I may like you a lot, Jerry, but nothing personal when I yell at you. Get it done. I, we have no time to reflect anymore. Why are we discussing? I've experienced this myself. My boss said, why are we still discussing this? I thought we have already resolved this. You should tell him to, he's, he's telling me to tell off my subordinate for confusing the issue. No, we all get along well. But Prof, can I read something? Here? Yeah. Now, this time I read the Harvard Business Review. There was an article on, is it basically on leadership? There's one article on emotional intelligence. Mm. And one author says uh, that emotional intelligence is so fundamental for performance and other things. They say that we are together, working together. This I'm a subordinate. Mm. We pass in, in relation culture, mm. we pass a certain remark that it hurts me very much. I think I will not be comfortable with you in that. Yeah. It's not such a thing that, yes, done, you can forget about it. No, of course, yeah, it's going to linger. I, yeah. I, I know, I mean, everybody goes through You're not yeah. the only one. Yeah. I mean, we can all relate to that. I wish they could have been a bit more sensitive uh -huh. because it takes so much time for me to heal from this and it's unnecessary. Yeah, true. That, is, see, that is always true. That's baseline. Yes, yeah. There's no, I'm talking about going beyond baseline to the kind of leadership we want. Somebody who's oozing with charisma and all that, uh, it, that's transformational. The, ref, the research and what is going on in the sea changes of disruption we see, and this thing is not going to let up. It's not so good news. We will have short periods of equilibrium. You know, this kind of plateau here, here and here, where we'll have rest phases. Then we can have the hand-holding. But otherwise, it's going to be quite relentless. It's going to be onslaught, onslaught, onslaught. Uh, Urgency-driven. Now, what you're raising is baseline. I think it's, you always have to be respectful. But the idea of transformation means somebody who comes in and just changes dramatically, right? If you look at the actual instances, that's confounding transformational leadership with charisma at certain inflection points in the evolution of a society. It's not a management tool book, tool book approach. And the, the news flashes, we're going to be going through this for another two decades. And that means it's urgency. Nothing personal. That's one of the reasons why the strong men are back, whether it's Xi Jinping or Dr. Emmons or Trump. Do you understand? Right? Now here, when you have continuous steady state change, you and I have time, yeah. right? And the process is transfer intrinsically transforming. All the psycho babble will kick in, okay? Now I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I'm just going telling you, it's not my opinion, I'm telling you what is there, okay? All right, so, the thing out of the box. Now let's go to the next slide. Let's come back to this. I'm going to go into higher order learning, which is non-functional. Okay, it's double loop. That means I examine the situational variables. And I will, it's iterative. Have I fixed the problem? Single loop is like a thermometer. There's a gap, let's fix it. Does not examine the undercurrents. Does not unpack, you know, the sociological factors, culture, institutions, the values, and so on. Now we need to unpack. Okay? I know psychology was to a large extent single loop, even though it, deal, it dealt with uh, individual differences, personality, cognitive styles, intelligence, it didn't go wider and deeper. Now we have to. For me to justify your question, well, I think we'll, we can be positive about Malaysia. It'll take longer. And I can defend why it should take longer. I'm not in a rush. I want a stable society. I don't care if I, we don't achieve 7% growth. Uh, we may take longer. I don't want to compare us to Singapore. You understand? Uh, and it's because I will go deeper and wider. Look at that. We have rural and urban. We're not a city state. So you're less homogenous. You understand? Yeah. And yeah. So I mean, this is higher order. All right. So the example of Proton and, and Parwaja, the design competency was not there. The education system and the country was not into design skills levels. To design engines in Lactoshi was telling my student, 
Honda and Toyota, the best engineers will leave. After 10 years, they will set up their consulting companies and serve their parent company. They visualize in 4D engines, 24 by 7. They dream the stuff. We don't have people like that. Honda makes excellent engines, you know. They, you know if you look at the, the US JD Power, the Japanese are on top. Lexus and Toyota are number one for quality and reliability, right? The Euro brands are below. Now the Koreans are catching up. You see, so now it takes me to, it's the same thing. I'm going to move on faster. Um, okay, so this is, uh, I'm going to, okay, here. Um, the traditional strategy has been stable, environment, and simple. Now it's complex and unstable. Uh, so we uh, have to be adaptive and flexible. We do by learning. It's not algorithmic, it's heuristic. In the five-year plans we used to have in Malaysia when I was growing up, algorithmic. Now it's, you know, after five years or two years, we are being whacked by this, whacked by that. The MSC and MDEC was not part of the five-year plans. Do you understand? Basic things, yes, five-year plans. So it's, algorithm means like computer program, guarantees a solution, but it can be going in the wrong direction. Now recently, I think it was, uh, Daim, right? Daim, Tun Daim was saying that our education policy is not about analytics. It should be about the knowledge society. He was correcting Masli. You understand? Just like we don't have people who can code, we don't have people who can design drive trains. We can't do this overnight. We are not a knowledge society where we, can have, we have design competencies. Remember, identify, isolate, identify, synthesize, simulate. Just like those guys who can design. You watch F1 races, right? The pit crews are looking at computer screens. They have sensors in the cars. TCS designs the communication system. TCS is a Tata company for the Formula One teams to communicate with each other. And they also have Ferrari's chief innovator for designing the engines. What has a company like this got to do with automotive engine design? There are people who can code, that's all. But the point is they can simulate. That is there in the Indian education system which we didn't realize. You know, those seven IITs and so on. You, know, you heard of those, right? Yeah. That's why they have those CML level fives, you know? And they go to America, they kick serious ass, right? It's not just about functional skills. They can run companies. 55% of startups are from that country in, 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 in Silicon Valley. It's huge. And they're 1% of the population, right? And that's a country which is where it's, you're ruthlessly competitive. It's nothing to do with culture, playing golf, speaking with the same accent and so on. Right, now, now, now we go to the heart of my model, and then I shall finish in 10 minutes. Uh, this is the model I developed when I was in Accenture, and then it was refined. Uh, this, in a way, maps with Bloom's taxonomy. You can easily recognize it, right? Uh, the lower levels are recalling, describing, application, and goes to the higher levels, which is um, evaluation. But notice it's not just a vertical hierarchy. There's a horizontal factor here which is breadth, right? Span. Breadth means uh, whatever I glean and learn, I can apply and impact wider than a functional unit, right? So at the bottom left, near transfer means monkey see, monkey do. Or a Malay proverb, bagaimana achuan bagitu la kue near. Whenever I say this, people get flawed. <laughs> like as if I'm so alien, huh? <laughs> you know that one, right? Cookie, cookie cutter thinking. So you go to the far right, and I don't mean you're, you're a fascist or whatever, right? You um, are able to span the boundaries. Now, this is interesting. The ones who I notice who are in talent management, in the knowledge capital firms like consulting firms, the, the brand ones, huh? the big names, they are capable of doing this. Whatever environment you put them in, they thrive. They're able to glean the insights bottom up inductively and apply. The others who are schooled, conceptually rich, are stuck. <laughs> They're trying to force fit. You understand? I have a PhD, I have a master's degree, da da da. Let me go. This fellow just intuitively inducts. Now, don't get me wrong, they have the concepts too. They have the a priori concepts, even theories. But they don't let that get in the way of seeing something for what it is they are able to unfreeze, to transcend. 
That's my point. And so they can thrive in any environment. So far transfer is zooming in and out of context, fluidly, effortlessly. Now I can go beyond any organizational unit across organizations in the industry. Can I go even beyond the industry? Yes. Is it necessary for, or valuable for me to go beyond the industry? Yes. Let me show you an example. I want people who can evaluate diversity in stakeholders. Right? If I was running a logging company in Sarawak, right? and I, I used to discount the activists, or the traditional people, the Penang, I say they're a nuisance. Uh, they're not really going to bother us because you know, we are investing in HRD, our managers are well trained, uh, we are generating revenues for the state government, right? and we are making profits, and we are listed in one of the best bourses in East Asia, in Hong Kong. These people who are bringing these issues up are creating a storm in a teacup. Shareholders are not interested. Is that a correct assumption? Wrong. When it happened to one company, they, had to, they were forced to delist from Hong Kong. I won't give you the name of the company. They were a client, right? Uh, these nuisances are now high on the radar. They are, another driver is sustainability, which we had the chart just now. The, you know, the, the change driver is attacking the knowledge company. Sustainability is a major driver. It's not a trend. Global warming was not a driver 20 years ago. Today, it's in your face. Trump may try to ignore it, but he can't, right? So here, this is not something to be dismissed, right? So the ability to evaluate diversity is very key. You understand? You'll be right on top there. You can go across industries. Another example, financial services. My senior managers, right? Why should they know something, anything about the healthcare industry? We are in finance. They can partner, right? Leasing, providing credit. People want credit cards, they can use long-term health benefits, insurance, right? I must think of the industry drivers in other industries. Again, it's the same kind of problem-solving skill sets, okay? So this is a model which I developed when I was, we were proposing for a tech transfer in KLIA, we got the job and we got lobbied out. I can't say anything anymore because we were deemed to be a foreign company, but we were not, okay? Uh, and uh, we were 200 percent, 300, 300 Malaysians. And we had partnered with a hollow company. And again, basically over here, we have north means, uh, and south, the, south is near transfer. Monkey see, monkey do, uh, Achuan thinking, domain thinking. And then what we want is northeast. That means I want the depth of the domain plus the ability to zoom out beyond the domain, to be interdisciplinary, or even domain free. This is the vital kind of thinking we need now, right? And uh, functional development is vertical and business breadth. And it's not, a, it's not monotonic. It's like setting up base camp. It's a zigzag kind of thing, but overall trend is progressive, just like in discontinuous chain. We need to develop this, but we don't knee-jerk react to go to vocational skills training. We stay true to this roots, and then we'll take care of this. Somehow, we've lost our way. You understand? And the pace is not going to let up, all right? So now, what I've used is all these things in my teaching learning, the papers go there. This is a South African telco. Some years ago, I was sent by this American school I was associated with. They did very well. They were acquired by Tata, but huge cultural problems. They had Tata came in to Joburg and fired all the, the blacks and the whites, brought in Indian managers. Tata is doing very well. Yeah, and then they, uh, they uh, what they did was they, they learned the hard way. They didn't moan the change. All right, so, but I give them a change approach based on this, an action learning approach. And uh, they, if you want, I can give you, send you the slides easier, all right? And it's published anyway, so, all right, so I'm gonna get out of this and finish up. Uh, let me see what I wanted to show you. Uh, there are papers, now one, these are the places where I've experimented with this. I've, they have learned transcendental meditation where they can do this far transfer. MUM is a university, and basically it's in the news. Let me show you what it's doing. Uh, basically, this is in Indonesia. We're teaching transcendental meditation. 
the schools in Bali, even Catholic universities, doing very well, right? Uh, this is the book that presented the model. This was in Geneva. Uh, it's UNESCO's TC3, uh, right? After Finland, I gave the key three three. Uh, after after Finland, I gave the keynote. Uh, these are the schools now. Now I'm going to talk about schools, which is children, but I'm, in my interest is in universities and postgraduate. Uh, this is San Francisco's toughest school. This is a Guardian, where they learn transcendental meditation. Bullying and everything went down. The grades went up. Now I really want. You know, it's a lot of work, but. There are grants available. Do you think we can approach Mitra? Last time we saw the government has changed. Should we get yeah, Tamil yeah. schools? Yeah. I spoke to a guy called, uh, I got his WhatsApp, and Lechman is a guy there. They are interested. But being government, they will take their time. You know, but I think this is a big thing, and there are grants yeah. for schools. Now, I'm not a school guy. I'm a university postgraduate guy. My research is in postgraduate. But this school stuff is taking off in a big way. In India, in Thailand, Indonesia, which is our neighbor, right? America is big. These are tough schools in San Francisco. Many other reports, and they've got a, these are my papers, Enlivening Fluid Intelligence, this is in El Salvia, and so on. So my model works with and without transcendental meditation. With transcendental meditation, it's even better. Now, I know the key people. Fred Travis is a brilliant guy in EEG. Uh, he's writing and publishing with me in this current book, along with Dr. Chan. Uh, he, he's supposed to do it. <laughs> and uh, he's writing the foreword, plus the president of Maharishi University, a world-renowned phys physicist, John Hagelin. Okay? Uh, Quantum unified field theorist from Harvard. He's writing the foreword, and of course, our colleague, Jeffrey, right? who is very stressed as I talk to him on the phone, and I kind of reminding him about his contribution. <laughs> He doesn't want to hear anything about this room business, okay? So this is where it all started. Let me show you this guy. You know who he is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he is the CEO and founder of Bridgewater. He says transcendental principles here. Transcendental meditation is the single most important factor of success. I had the videos lined up here. I sent it to Dr. Chan and he found the book interesting, right? Let me show you a few examples, and then we are done. We can get out of here. Uh, okay, so this is Martin Scotti. See, you know, right? He's a director. These are two dear friends of the David Lynch Foundation, dear friends of mine, and great human being. You know, the David Lynch is a Hollywood director, and the person on the right is Martin Scotti. a very famous Hollywood director. He does all these gangster movies, The Wolf of Wall Street. You know, the one that was uh, malicious money and all that. He's the director. He's a very famous director. He, he made a new movie called Silence, about uh, missionary work in Japan. Brilliant film. Wow. Many Hollywood celebrities, you know, Hugh, Hugh Jackman, Oprah Winfrey, all promote transcendental meditation. David Lynch is a director who takes, has set up a fund along with Paul McCartney, the Beatles. They have concerts. Actresses like uh, Katy, Katy Perry is another singer. Uh, that guy, that her ex-husband, what's his name, uh, Russell Brand, they all contribute and to t target schools who are at risk. So I was thinking of Tamil schools. They don't have to be from good schools. They can be from the roughest schools. So in, in Detroit, the schools, children fight bullying, drugs. Columbia, we have a whole Catholic, 1,800 schools, drug-infested drug region, a Catholic school, Catholic priest, put Transcendental Meditation, Rio de Janeiro. So it's not even religion. Uh, Muslim schools in Palestine, Indonesia, Jakarta, Surabaya, Bali. You know, so now this is, listen to what they say. And they practice Transcendental Meditation. Ray this is Ray Dalio. For 45 years, 40 years, and Marty for since 2008. Yes, every day, every day, twice a day, as much as I can twice a day. Um, the thing about it is that there's a kind of a, a peacefulness that I don't think I've ever achieved before, really. And, and I must say, you know, it has made uh, a major difference because, uh, particularly in the morning, particularly in the morning, because the amount of things that have to be done and the thing you have to worry about, this suddenly it just comes together and you stop. I find that I can't do without it that way, literally. 